on your own life journey. I do hope that this church and perhaps at some point, <laughs> some of the congregational, I hope it can help you on that path. And it is a beautiful day. I know there's heat coming, like a hundred and some odd degrees later this week. So that makes this even more special. And as Irene has already mentioned to any of the fathers who are out there, um, maybe later through FCAT or Zoom, and also to the fathers who've gone on to the eternal reward, um, a blessed and happy Father's Day to everyone. And I hope you're able to enjoy it in some special way. Let us now turn to our bulletins for our um, opening hymn and candlelight, Red Hymnal number seven, Immortal, Invisible, Only God. Unfaithful. As our heavenly parent, 
you will not desert or despise us. Rather, you encourage us to see what is possible. The gift of hope we will not take for granted. Lead us now in our time of worship and draw us a little closer.
mustard bush. I've never seen a mustard bush, but I looked online, and it does get to be a pretty large bush. And right in the center is this tiny, tiny, tiny little seed. And that is actually a mustard seed. And so today's gospel is talking about, you know, that mustard seed of faith, and it grows into this big bush, and even the birds of the air can find their, their uh, nesting there. And so I think this is one of those, those uh, parables of Jesus that is just so profound, and that the way it was captured, that little mustard seed here for a child, it just makes Jesus' stories real, but they're understandable, but there's also so much more to it. The story can keep telling stories. And so for a child, you know, you, with Sunday school and church, you, you nurture that little seed of faith and you hope that it can someday flourish and become, you know, big enough that birds of the air can nest there. And uh, that, that takes time. And so for a Sunday school student, that's that message that you've got to put time into this uh, to go from the seed uh, to the full-grown tree. And uh, on Father's Day, there's also that important message of, you know, that hope and promise seed can become something that, you know, is uh, special to you. And so I just wanted to share this little thing because, you know, in Jesus' day, Jesus is, you know, wise, but he's not yet divine all-knowing because that he, gave, he gives up all of that. He empties himself that, he says in, in uh, the Philippians letter. Um, but Jesus is looking for the smallest thing that he can imagine. So he doesn't know about molecules and atoms and quarks. But he does know about that little tiny seed. And he takes the smallest thing he can imagine and he said, uses that as an example, that smallest little tidbit of faith that you may have can become something great if it's nourished. Um, so that, that's a message for children and for all, to, to nurture our faith. And I think we have a, um, a special gift today. And I won't say any more because I'm confused about the secret, so I don't understand. Okay, but I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to sit down here.
I supposed to do now? Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 just prayers I'm just concerned about people during the heat wave so just prayers for people's safety I, I think I heard you say that the heat index is 105 it's, that's what they're saying now yeah, yeah. It, it might be in certain days and certain yeah. times yeah all right um, any other prayer intentions okay let's, uh, let's <laughs> offer our prayers for Alan Alice Amy and Todd Antonia and family Angie, Angie, Art, Bill, Bill, Bill Bonnie, Chris, and family, Cheryl, Cindy, Edna, Frank, Ray, 
Grayson, Jeff, Jim, John, John, Kathy, Leslie, Liz, Lynn, Marsha, Mary Jane, and Joe, Michelle, Mike, Pauline, Richard, Sandra, Sandra and John, Steve, Steve and Kelly, Sue, Virginia and Richard, Wink, victims of violence and natural disasters anywhere in the world, and we pray for peace on earth. We are now turning inward for just a few moments of silence to offer God those prayers that we choose not to say out loud, but they are heard loud and clear by God. So just a few moments of silence. Righteous God, whose works are greater than our wildest imagination and most sophisticated study, plant the seed of your word among us today, and let each of us welcome the good news that you would plant within and among us, inspiring us deeper thinking, braver inventiveness, and more open perceptiveness. May our lives be the fertile ground in which your love bursts into life to nourish us and all whom we may meet, as our loving Heavenly Parent. Bless all the fathers of our community and give them the wisdom needed to fulfill their call to parenthood. And bless with eternal rest those fathers who have already been called to their heavenly rewards. Lastly, hear all the prayers that we have directed to you today and answer them only as you are able. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And may we now share in the prayer that Jesus gave to all of us. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
church. And we also want to remember that today, in a world where God was kind of scary, um, as we heard in today's first reading, when Samuel shows up and the community is terrified, what it means to have God be sent to them. We instead have a Savior who reveals a God of parental love. So when we talk about God's love, it can't be based on fear, it can't be based on ignorance, it has to be based on closeness and love. And so for all that you do to allow this church to continue to express that message, that gospel message, that God is a loving parent for any and all, thank you for all that you do, thank you for your offerings, and may God bless us and these gifts to his purpose we pray. Amen. And our reflecting hymn today is Red Hymn number 227, Fairest Lord Jesus.
done this here for? Um, I love mythology, and um, I thought maybe since I had my, my daughters from the very beginning, and before they could be tempted away by all other kinds of things, I would be able to influence them. And so my first daughter is born in March of 1993, <laughs> I got that right. So she was born in March of 1993. And before we had kids, Sharon and I in December, we loved going out to Boston in December because of all the lights and the, you know, the, the just like joyful you know, stuff going on. Well, that came, came kind of an end when the kids were born. But the last time we were out there, and I have the little mark in here, 12, 18, 92. So this is the December before my first kid even born. And we're in Harvard Square, we're in the Harvard Bookstore, and I pick up the children's home. And I picked up the children's home because I had these grand ideas that I would be holding cradle in my little baby, and I would read to them stories of Greek mythology, and they would grow up to be these profound thinkers about Greek mythology and everything else. Well, it just never happens. Now. <laughs> so they uh, instead, my daughter, my daughter was born a couple weeks premature. Something called a sphincter muscle wasn't fully developed. The acidic stuff in her stomach kept up here in her esophagus. She wouldn't sleep for anything. And so the idea, that beautiful idea, of just relaxing and reading my daughter home, or instead turned into I still remember one arm against the wall. You know those little carriers for babies, <laughs> just rocking back and forth. And instead of Homer, I watched endless reruns of Cheers, <laughs> um, trying to get her to go to bed. So the story is, is that you know what you know what you plant with your child, and no matter how much you know you try to influence them, they become who they're supposed to be on their own. Um, and, and I think there's a there's a special gift with that, letting them become who they're supposed to be on their own. You can try as hard as you want, you know, doing all this thing. I, I remember that you were supposed to be able to, uh, like, if you played with their fingers, uh, the synapses and the nerves and all that between here and their brain would be more developed if you gave them more attention. So I would play with their fingers, hoping that you know they would be like you know an Anthony at the piano and all that. Um, instead, my wife, who was an all-state athlete, just her genes eat up my genes, <laughs> and, and so they they they'd much more prefer sports than than uh, homework or the piano, um, but I gave it a shot. And, and so that message on this Father's Day and, and this idea of parenting in general and also applied to God is that the seed is planted, um, but we're allowed to become who we're supposed to be. And you know with that, that mustard seed that I showed, and I um, have it somewhere here, I, I hope I don't lose it before I go home, but it is tiny, tiny, tiny. And the thing is, though, if you put that mustard seed in the ground, it's going to come up as a mustard shrub. And, and, and that kind of already sets the way for the, what you expect. But I, I, I like to think about the way that God plants the seed of faith in us and, and give, even the, the, the gift of life. I, I have these wildflower seeds, and I plant them around the edge of my, uh, my lawn where that, it turns into woods. And I wanted like, just the flowers, these wildflowers, to come up. And when you scatter the, the wildflowers, and you have no idea what you're scattering. Uh, you know, when it comes up, you don't know if it's going to be days here. I don't even know what they're called, but you don't know what's going to come up. And I, I like that idea a little bit more than just the mustard seed, because then you know it's going to be that mustard bush. But I love that analogy where you can spread the seed, and what comes up, we don't know until it comes up. And, and I think God would, would allow for something like that, allow us to become who we are. And I also want to talk, um, because it's, it's uh, mythology there, and it's Father's Day, I, I want to talk just a little bit, because Jesus talks about parables, I want to go back to the Greek mythology, because they're all stories, just like Jesus was a storyteller. The Greeks had these beautiful stories, and the creation story is, is one that's really kind of amazing, uh, because it's so close to the Genesis story. It starts with chaos. Every story begins with chaos, because no one knows where the first beginning is. And so you've got this chaos, just roiling chaos. And somehow out of chaos comes guy, earth. And earth then also creates Uranus. And so you've got the sky and the earth, and they came together like this. And that's the way the Greeks thought that the, the, the world began. Gaia and Uranus, the sky and the earth. And, and then they have babies, titans. And one of those titans is called Kronos. And so you've got time. And I don't know if you know the beginning of the Genesis story, but in the beginning, you know, there's chaos. And then out of that chaos, God creates the heaven and the earth, which is Genesis 1-1. And by the time you get to the end of the very first paragraph in our Bible, then you also have, it was evening 
and it was morning, it was the first day, you have time. And so, in the Greek mythology, you've got earth, you've got sky, you've got time. And in Genesis, you've got earth, you've got sky, you've got time. So there's the same message there. Um, but these, the father imagery in the, the, in the, in the uh, myths is not all that, you know, complementary to fathers. So Uranus is not a good father, and so his son Kronos, um, you know, removes him. He's gone. He does it in a really cruel way, and so he's gone. And so now you've got Kronos, who knows what he did to his father, and so he's wary of all of his children coming along, maybe taking over for him. And so what he does is every time one of his babies is born, he eats them. <laughs> so this is the story. The father eats them. And so since they're divine beings, they grow inside of him. Um, because, you know, he's in the sky. And so they're, they're all growing inside of him. But mama's getting a little bit ticked off at daddy and all the things. <laughs> and so mama, even on Father's Day, comes out looking good. Father's not so good. And so, so the mother is eating all these babies, and mama says, that's it. And so mama wraps her last baby, Zeus, in, in swaddling clothes and feeds a rock to the, to the godfather instead and lets Zeus sneak away. And the father, again, Kronos is not too smart. He eats the rock because he knows how to eat. And so, so he eats the rock, and Zeus goes away. Zeus grows up, and you know what's going to happen. Zeus is going to rise up. He's going to overthrow his father, Kronos. And before he does that, he has them re regurgitate all his brothers and sisters. And out of that regurgitation is also the rock that replaced Zeus. And Zeus takes that rock and places it in a place called Delphi. In Delphi, you may have heard, that's kind of famous site in Greece, that's where um, all these people would come to get, you know, the future told to them. They'd have all these oracles from Delphi. It became the center of the Greek world. And that rock was supposedly right there in the center of Delphi. But when you went to Delphi and heard their oracles, a lot of times you would think you heard what you wanted to hear, but it was something completely different, and it would trick you into something you didn't want to happen, but was going to happen. And that's where I finally get back to Pharaoh. So they had this story that you had to invest yourself in to find the truth. It wasn't like two plus two is four. It was more like a poetic kind of wisdom. You had to, you had to try to get into the story to discover what was being revealed to you. And when Jesus talks with stories, the amazing thing is, is that the eternal, mysterious, all-powerful, all-knowing Word of God comes down and can be shared in a story like that of a mustard seed. And that's really important. Because in a world where illiteracy was the norm, okay, and if you could read, it was the, uh, it was the exception. Jesus comes down, and he doesn't go to the temple with all the people who can read. He doesn't go to the king and all the people who can read in the court. He goes to everyone, to the illiterate masses, and Jesus tells them the message of God through stories so that they can understand God. And so through these stories, they have a really deeper understanding and appreciation of who God is. And the thing is about those stories, just like Delphi, you know, for 2,000 years, we've been telling that story like about the mustard seed, and there's always something new. People who have doctors in New Testament studies can look in the Bible, and they're always discovering something new. That's because it's the still-speaking Word of God coming down in something as simple as a story. And so the powerful Word of God is simple in the story, so that all of us can come close to God. Because God is our heavenly parent. And like not being afraid, you know, Samuel's coming to town, that can't be anything good. Oh my God, what's Samuel going to say to us? Instead, when we think about God, we should be as a heavenly parent, embrace it. And not like something that we have to be fearful of. And so it also says, with many such parables, Jesus spoke the words to them as they were able. And so as we get deeper into our faith, God speaks more in depth to us, so that a Sunday school lesson can become a Bible study lesson. And then at home can be delved into even deeper, and it speaks to us in our soul, so that God is always speaking to us. And you know, that, that message about that mustard seed and that the potential to become, I think that's a powerful message because I think some people think that once you reach a certain age, you know, I, I got God and, and I'm fine with God where he is, and the message there is, you're never fine with where you are with God. You always have to grow closer to God, because God is going to pull you in. And so, like when my daughters came home yesterday and we spent the day together, you know, it wasn't anything exceptional, but it was special. And so, when you get that time, when you get that idea that God is something special in your life, even if it's not all that special, just doing something ordinary, 
It means a lot. And I think that's the kind of relationship God is trying to build. And so that whole message about growing into the faith made this church and our time here help us to grow and develop that little seed of faith so that we can become closer to a God who loves us like a parent. And for these things we pray in Jesus' name. And our hymn of closing today is Red Hymn number 93, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.